last time we talked about internal flow inside of pipes and we had the velocity profile typically for a laminar flow what's the velocity profile look like parabolic and for a turbulent flow what does the velocity profile look like inside of a pipe turbulent flow more flat slug yeah so it's also time averaged it's a time average that's the velocity profile because it's uh, jumping all around they're swirling and it's not chaos but it's it's not laminar flow it's turbulent flow so we talk about the average velocity what is the average velocity in turbulent flow it's nearly the velocity in the center line what is the average velocity in laminar flow? It's one half of the center line's velocity, one half. The, the velocity profile for a pipe of radius r is given by u max one minus r over cap r squared. So u is a function of r is u max one minus r over cap r squared. Determine the average velocity of the pipe, U, A, V, G. How do we do that? Well, you, you do the... I put the area over here, but it starts like this. The, this gives you the volumetric flow rate. And you want that volumetric flow rate to be equal to the sum of the little volumetric flow rates over the velocity profile, which is the integral of U, D, A. So we'll move that A over here now, and that's the equation for the average velocity. 1 over A, the integral of U dA. And so area is pi R squared. We integrate from lowercase r equal to 0 to lowercase r equal to cap R of U as a function of R, which is U max, 1 minus lowercase r over cap R squared and then dA is 2 pi r dr so far so good cancel the pi's move this r to here and to there that r squared and now we have that the u average is equal to uh, u max times the integral from 0 to 1 of 2 times 1 minus x squared times x times dx, where basically you're defining x as r over cap r. True? And when you compute this integral right here, you get one half and so the average velocity is half of that center line velocity for laminar flow how would I do that integral in practice on the internet just type in integrate into Wolfram Alpha 1 minus x squared times x from 0 to 1 and comes back with a quarter. I didn't put the two in there, did I? I need that two. Then it comes back with a half. All right. So if you take a look, that two makes it a half. Okay. Any questions about that? That's one of those little touchstones. Oh, yeah. We, everybody that's taken a class like this of fluid mechanics knows that laminar velocity profile is parabolic, maximum in the center line, and the average is half of the center line velocity. So we talked about laminar flow. It's staying in laminars or layers. That's where the word derives from. So if you had color-coded blue over purple, over red, and they were all flowing in the pipe. Later down the pipe, the blue would still be in its same layer. The purple 
chunks of fluid in that layer and the red in that layer, they would have just flown down the tube, staying in the relative same positions. That's laminar flow turbulent. It's well mixed. You have eddies. You have just, I don't know what to say. It's turbulent flow. Uh, who studied it? Osborne Reynolds, the years that he lived. He came up with the Reynolds number, characterizing the ratio competing forces inside the flow. So it's rho, u, some length scale, d diameter for pipe flow over mu. This u, sometimes just put a cap v there. It's the average velocity down the pipe. All right. Uh, it's a ratio of what? Inertial to viscous forces. We talked about that before. And then we have the Reynolds, a critical Reynolds number, C or CR. Uh, for pipe flow, it's around 2300 or 2000, somewhere in there. And so if your actual Reynolds number is below the critical, you expect it to be laminar. If it's above the critical, you expect it to be turbulent. When we do external flow, we have flow over a plate, and the critical Reynolds number would be half a million. Where did that come from? Experimental observation. Uh, why don't they renormalize these so the critical Reynolds number is one? Then if I'm much less than one or much greater than one, well, because you'd have to get the length scale. And the length scale for the pipe, the easiest one, is the diameter. And so we use it, and so you get a number that's not one. It's 2,300. Similarly, for flow over a flat plate, half a million. Why that? Why is that the critical Reynolds number? It's because you use the most convenient length scale, which is the distance from the leading edge. When you have non-circular pipes, you introduce the hydraulic diameter. The hydraulic diameter is four cross-sectional area wetted perimeter. If you go back and apply it to a round pipe, which is circular, you'll find that the hydraulic diameter is equal to the physical diameter, which is good. But you can then uh, get compute the hydraulic diameter for a flow in a square duct or square pipe. And if it's length A and le length A, did we work that out last time? Yeah, right? And so for this case, it's um, the, the cross-sectional area is A squared. The wetted perimeter is 4A. And when you put it into the equation, you get that it's equal to A. The hydraulic diameter is just A. You can work it out for ellipse. You can work it out for triangle. You could work it out for whatever rectangular shape of the duct that you might have, non-circular shaped duct. And the textbook has a number of, at least one table with them in there, right, for the hydraulic diameters. Entrance region. Did we talk about the entrance region? So we talked about a quick review here. You have a pipe flow. and We're going to study where it's fully developed flow in a pipe, but it has to get into the pipe. How large is that section? How long is that section where it's getting into the pipe and developing hydrodynamically? When you first come into the pipe, the velocity profile looks pretty straight, flat across. And then as it goes down, it feels the effects of the walls, but the core speeds up. And then finally, way down the pipe, you'll maybe if it's going to be laminar flow, it'll have finally the quadratic velocity profile, the fully developed velocity profile. But this length is the entrance distance. It really depends on whether the flow is going to eventually be laminar or turbulent. If it's going to be turbulent, it'll because of the mixing, it'll develop much quicker. It'll have a shorter entrance region. So the length entrance is about 10 diameters if the Reynolds number is greater than the critical Reynolds number, if it's going to be turbulent. And the entrance region is about 1 20th the Reynolds number times diameter. You could put a Reynolds number of 1,000, which is below 2,000. That would be laminar. 
and uh, you would find that, oh, that's quite a few distances. How many diameters is it if you put in a Reynolds number of 1,000? Do you remember? 50? You just quick do the math. It's like 50,000 divided by 20. About 50 diameters. That's a lot lo lo longer than 10 diameters. Okay, so that's when the Reynolds number is less than the critical, which is around 2,300. What would be the longest you would expect? Well, put in the critical uh, transition or critical Reynolds number around 2,000 in there, and you have now 100 diameters. That would be the. You wouldn't expect any entrance region to be longer than 100 diameters. So, uh, want to develop the equation for laminar flow in pipes. We want to derive the differential equation that governs the velocity profile, and then we want to solve that differential equation and show the quadratic velocity profile. So, we start with a pipe. We introduce the coordinate direction x down the length of the pipe in the direction of flow. It x is all the books I've seen, it's always in the direction of the flow. The flow is the flow is going that way. Okay? Down the pipe. And then we also have the coordinate direction r going from the center line out to cap r, the radius of the pipe. And we look at a little region here. Now that little region looks like a cylinder of fluid. It has a, a face on this side, which feels a pressure pushing in the positive x. And also on the back side, the pressure further down the pipe. So we're talking about at location x and at location x plus delta x. At the location x plus delta x on that ring face of that little chunk of fluid that we're analyzing, we're doing a force balance on, it's pushing in the negative x. The pressure is pushing in the negative x. And so those are two forces right away. We have pressure at location x acting on the face 2 pi r delta r. That's the area of that ring. Then we have minus because it's operating at the in the, in the negative x direction or pushing it backwards p at x plus delta x, which should be lower because the pressure is dropping in the direction of flow. True? Is, is, does that make sense? p at x plus dx is lower than p at x. And then the area, 2 pi r delta r. So those are two normal uh, stresses or normal forces due to the pressure. How about the shear? The shear... Uh, the, f the flow on the inside of the pipe is faster than the flow in, the co in that ring, so it's trying to push it in the positive x direction. And the flow on the outside of that s section is trying to push it in the negative because of viscous shear stresses. So we finish out the equation. We're going to have the shear stress at R acting on that inner surface area, which is 2 pi r delta x. 2 pi r delta x, right? And then in the negative, we have the shear stress at r plus delta r. It's further out. And it's operating at 2 pi r plus delta r delta x. So it's a larger radius as well on that outer surface, r plus delta r is equal to x. Those sum to zero for a fully developed velocity profile. It's not accelerating in the core. There's no acceleration in the x. Okay. So we rearrange, we do some algebra with this equation. We have that p at x plus delta x um, uh, minus p at x it, let's cancel the two pies. Let's try to cancel the two pies. 
Okay, doesn't want to write for me now. Why do you not want to write? Come on now. Uh, delta R. Give me a minute. We'll see if we can. All right, so we cancel the two pies, and then we rearrange. We're going to have uh, over delta delta x delta r. The delta r's cancel. You're left with delta x. Then you're going to have um, a. Uh, you could put that r right here. Okay. Plus uh, tau at r plus delta r times r plus delta r minus tau at r times r divided by delta r. All right, that's equal to zero. Algebra look good? What do we use? Fundamental theorem of calculus. Let the dx and the dr go to limit of zero. And so you pick up r derivative of change in pressure with respect to x plus derivative with respect to r uh, tau r equal to zero. So what is uh, tau? Is it mu du dr? Yes, sir. Uh, this is a wraparound. I didn't want to fit it. I couldn't fit it all on one line without going all the way across the page. Oh, I left off a plus. Thank you. Right? Okay. So, what does this Newton's law of viscosity? So, we'll stick that in. And, and also, we make the observation that this is a constant we talked about that where if the pressure is changing as you go down the length of the pipe fully developed flow for every meter it's the same pressure drop boom 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 it's not changing the gradient the, of the pressure the, the change in pressure with respect to x is a constant okay and so what we pick up is we pick up a uh, uh, dp let me put this over here on this side negative dp dx and then we'll put the derivative with respect to r of uh, minus mu du dr. And we still have an r inside. And we bring over the 1 over r. And clean this up a little bit. 1 over r with a minus sign. Well, how's that equation look? Look OK? which you can then just get rid of these minus signs. All right. Well, this is our uh, governing differential equation, which allows us to derive or establish that velocity profile. It's second order. We need two boundary conditions. So boundary condition number one is that the rate of change of u with respect to r at r equal to zero is equal to zero. What's that saying? It's at the center line. It's at a maximum. And its slope is zero because it's symmetric. And the boundary condition number two, u at cap r is equal to zero. It goes to no slip at the wall of the pipe. So with those two boundary conditions, that differential equation, we begin the process of separating and integrating. So we first separate. So you let d r u d u d r. That's a mu, sorry. That's a mu viscosity equal to d p d x times r d r. Successfully separated. Now we integrate, and you have. Uh, let me move the mu out. Mu r du dr equal to uh, dp dx one half r squared. At this point, you can have that constant of integration right there. 
but we can evaluate using the first boundary condition. And we come down here for the first boundary condition. We note that at r equal to zero, the derivative is equal to zero, r is equal to zero, everything zero except for c1, c1 has to be zero. So we conclude that c1 is equal to zero. Or just wait and do it later, but you can do that right now. Now we have the equation right here with c1 set to zero. And uh, we now separate and integrate. So what we'll have is we'll have a mu du is equal to dp dx one half r dr. Algebra look good? Integrate, we'll have mu u equal to dp dx one fourth r squared plus another constant of integration, c2. Come down with our second equation. And we say that at cap r, u has to be 0 at cap r. And so we find that c2 is equal to negative uh, dp dx 1 fourth cap r squared. Did I do that OK? I'm tight. I'm pressed for space here. <laughs> Hopefully that's OK. Uh, let's continue on. And so u is equal to uh, dp dx times 1 fourth. Uh, you have a, uh, I'm going to try and finish it up right here. We're going to put 1 minus lowercase r over cap r squared. So I'm going to put a minus sign with that dp dx. And we'll put the mu right there. I pause, I look at that, and there's a couple steps of algebra in there. But uh, do you agree? You get minus dp dx times r squared divided by 4 mu. And so this is the velocity profile. It's quadratic in nature. And you can rewrite it as u is equal to u max times 1 minus lowercase r over cap r squared. And then we already found that it's equal to 2u average times 1 minus lowercase r cap r squared. Or u average is equal to, well, 2u average is equal to uh, r squared over 4 mu minus dp dx. Does that make sense? All that makes sense. So we'll just edit, copy that. And we'll build on that for calculating the pressure loss. So we'll do a paste. The result for the laminar velocity profile, this is what we had. Well, what is the pressure drop or the pressure loss? Isn't the pressure loss equal to negative dp dx times some L. You have to know the length down the pipe. Multiply that by the, the change in pressure with respect to length, and you'll get the pressure loss. And so what we can do is rearrange the equation here. And what we'll get is we'll get that the, um, the pressure loss um, well, let me build it up slowly. Let's do negative dp dx times L is equal to, uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to write it all out, r squared divided by 4 mu equal to 2u average. Okay? So I took that equation and I switched it around 
and I put an L there and I have an R squared here and I'm going to put an L right there. That doesn't seem much, much does it? But I want to get rid of these R squareds. Well, uh, 2R is equal to a diameter. So if I take and replace it by diameter squared, it's over 4 or just take the 4 to this side. There's a couple steps in algebra. Then take this 4 also to that side as well as the mu, the viscosity, as well as one of the diameters, D. I know where I want to go, it's just tedious in the algebra, I'm rearranging terms. It's just taking the equation and rearranging and introducing terms. And then I want to introduce a one-half here. If I introduce a one-half there, it's it's like multiplying with another 2 right there on the other side. And I want to put a row here. I want to put a row there. And I want to put a U average squared right there. I'll put a U average squared right there. But since I already have 1 there, I can cancel it like that. Okay, we're there. Okay, because this group of terms is simply uh, the pressure loss, D over L, one-half rho U average squared, equal to 4 times 4 times 4, 64, over rho U average D over mu. And then we notice, oh, that's 64 over the Reynolds number based on diameter. And this is given the name friction factor. Friction factor. So for laminar flow only, we find that the friction factor is 64 over the Reynolds number. Another great achievement in fluid mechanics. Not because it's so much, it's applicable to so many problems because a lot of our flow are turbulent flow problems, not laminar flow problems, but because mathematics took us so far, we're able to develop this relationship analytically. Oh, it was a lot of work, but we're able to get it. True? Yeah. One year is the radius? A D? Rho. Rho is mass density of the fluid that's flowing. So rho is mass density of the fluid, and mu is the what? Viscosity of the fluid that's flowing. Fluid properties. Okay. Let's solve a problem. So water at 5 degrees C, and there the, that, that's it. Temperature-dependent properties. Mass density is not so temperature-dependent, but the viscosity is. So there's our density and viscosity for water. It says it's flowing through a three millimeter diameter uh, tube or pipe. It's uh, nine meters long, that's the length of the pipe. And it has an average velocity of uh, 90 centimeters per second, 0.9 meters per second. Determine the head loss, the pressure drop, and the minimum pump power required to overcome this loss. So first thing when you approach these problems, typically the pattern is, I want to know if it's laminar or turbulent. Do I have enough money? Not money. I never have enough money. Do I have enough information? <laughs> Do I have enough information to determine if it's laminar or turbulent flow? I would have to calculate what dimensionless parameter to check it? The Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number is rho U average, or just put V, just put V, everybody understands V. It's average speed or average velocity. Diameter over mu, because Reynolds numbers flow in a pipe. You know, you could also express it as 4 M dot over pi D mu. It's just re-expressing it, okay? So I like both of those forms. If I know mass flow rate or volumetric flow rate, the second form is better. 
if I know the average speed in the pipe, the first form is better. Okay? All right. Okay, let's do this. Um, do I know the, it's, it's right here, the speed is 90 centimeters per second. The density is known, the viscosity is known, and the diameter is known. So we calculate the Reynolds number for this, and we find it's 1776. What do we conclude because of that? It's not July the 4th, 1776. It's uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, it's uh, laminar. True. Now, if we know that, then we know that the friction factor is equal to 64 divided by the Reynolds number. So you can calculate the friction factor, 0 0.03603. Keep as many digits in your calculator as possible, right? Once I know that friction factor, how can I calculate the head loss? Well, we recall that the friction factor was defined as a pressure loss times uh, D um, over L divided by what half rho v squared, the velocity of pressure. Is that true? So that you can unravel to get that the pressure loss is equal to the friction factor, length divided by diameter, one half rho v squared, velocity pressure. This equation will work for laminar as well as turbulent flow. Right now we already have F, the friction factor, because we knew it was laminar, it was 64 over Reynolds number. So we know this value. We know the length, diameter, density, and the velocity. We just have to run the numbers. You find that the pressure loss is 48, yeah. 43.8 kilopascal. Now, is that even good to three significant digits? Not really. Two. Two significant digits. We'll give it to three. We'll report it to three, but really, don't have to report these to like four and five and six. It just is, it's not there, okay? The accuracy is just not there, okay? Now, what about the head loss? Is the head loss related to the pressure loss by having rho g head loss is equal to the pressure loss. So I could just divide by rho g. And you calculate the head loss to be 4.46 meters. And then what about the minimum pumping power required to overcome this loss? Well, what was the interpretation of the head loss? Energy per unit weight, right? Energy per unit weight. What was the pressure, pressure loss, pressure? Energy per unit volume. So a power will be energy per unit time which is energy per unit volume times volume per unit time. Doesn't that work? So if you want to know this minimum, which is the fluid pumping power or fluid power, that's mechanical fluid power that's dissipated, it's lost through that pressure drop, through that viscous effects, it's taking that mechanical energy and dissipating it into thermal energy. Okay, so it's equal to the pressure loss times the volumetric flow rate, volume per unit time. It's going to be AV, the volumetric flow rate. Well, what's A? A is pi d squared over 4, and V was given 90 centimeters per second. So you calculate the volumetric flow rate multiplied by the pressure loss. You have the minimum power because that's going to have to be supplied to the fluid by some pump or external mechanical energy source. 
and you calculate W dot fluid, 0 0.28 watts. Not much, but there it is. Questions? Yes, sir. If we think like an energy balance, I guess we say the Q out from this pipe to what would be a key loss, and now the temperature change is negligible. Oh, well. What happens is, is uh, that mechanical energy is going somewhere. It's going into internal energy. So you will have a realized increase in temperature, but it'll be something like 0. 0.0001 degree C change because uh, that's not a lot of mechanical power is being dissipated. It's going into increased internal energy. But it's so small, it's very difficult to detect it by taking a temperature measurement. Pressure measurement's easy. You'll see the pressure loss. That help? Okay, if it's turbulent flow, all you have the difference is how to get that friction factor. You can't do it analytically. Not by 64 over Reynolds number. We have to use a chart, the Moody diagram. We'll get to that in another slide or two. Turbulent flow, that's right. The same pattern. It's just now this friction factor has the same definition. And there you go. Let me back up uh, this one thing that I don't know if I did. I said the Reynolds number, everybody memorizes rho V D over mu for internal flow, pipe flow, right? Uh, I also said it was equal to what? 4 M dot over pi D mu. What? How do you get that it's equal to 4 mass flow rate over pi d mu? And believe me, that formula is very helpful when they tell you volumetric flow rates. I mean, all you do then is you can break it down into multiple steps to get, okay, if they give me the diameter, I get the area. If they give me the volumetric flow rate, then I can get the velocity, and then I'll just use this equation. But if you just say, uh, let's do this one. Um, what is the uh, the area? Is it pi d squared over 4? So I multiplied by 1. Okay. And then what is the volumetric flow rate, AV? How about the mass flow rate? Is it rho AV? And so the rows go, the areas go, the Vs go. And one of the D's go, and you're left with 4 M dot over uh, pi D mu. Well, I, I kind of have it memorized in my mind. You see how that, so either one, uh, if you know your mass flow rate or your volumetric flow rate, because this is 4 rho times AV divided by pi D mu. Okay. Now, another thing was, uh, pr Professor, you calculated pressure drop first, and then you calculated head loss. Why didn't you solve for A and then solve for B? You could, um, but I realized one thing that I didn't show you and I need to show you now is this friction factor right here. Some books will put it as a delta PL or just a PL. Sometimes they, they leave off that delta, right? It's just pressure loss or pressure drop. And then, what was it, D over L divided by 1 half rho V squared. That's great. You memorize that. You look in another textbook, and they'll have HL. They'll have D over L. They'll have V squared over 2G. And you say to yourself, they sure don't look the same, do they? But are they the same? Is it the same F? And the first time I remember when I looked at that and I would see a different textbook, a different plot and look at the, and I'd say, those are different. They must have a typo. And then even I've seen it in textbooks where they'll put something. I like to distinguish that H from that H. Okay. But they'll have some HL, some head loss. Okay. They'll have D over L. And then they'll have one half uh, v squared.
are they all good? Are they all equivalent? Or, or is there typos in some of them? They're not typos. What it is, is you can see the differences right here. That's our velocity pressure. It is units of pressure. This was our velocity head. This is our kinetic energy, our energy per unit mass due to its speed. So that's the only thing changed other than the pressure loss, head loss, or mechanical energy loss, specific mechanical energy loss. But all of these work, okay? So uh, you might want to get real familiar with, okay, this problem, I want to use this form. Okay. On an exam, you're time limited. You don't have time to be working through all of these little manipulations. You need to do that during your homework, right? So that you're efficient at solving problems on exams. If you have laminar flow and non-circular pipes, People have worked it out. It's analytically challenging. They revert to numerical methods, and then they can get some, some something like the friction factor for a flow in a square cross-sectional or a triangular cross-sectional or elliptical cross-sectional is equal to some constant over the Reynolds number. It's always just changing that constant. It's just changing the numeric value of that constant. It was 64 for a round pipe. For a square, it's different. Triangle, different. Ellipse, different. Okay, You can look in the textbook for the tables for non-circular pipes. When they use non-circular pipes, uh, what is this Reynolds number based on? It's based on a hydraulic diameter. What is that hydraulic diameter? For the cross-sectional area over the wetted perimeter. True? Yep. Water flows through a square channel with smooth surfaces. So we have a square cross section, square channel. The flow is laminar. The average velocity of the fluid is doubled. So we, we used to go with speed V1, but now you double it, and this is the new case, V2. Subscript 1 and 2, previous case, current case, new case. Okay. Assume the flow remains laminar. How does the head loss change? Okay, we had some uh, head loss initial. Uh, how does the head loss change? Does it double? Does it go up by 2 squared? Does it go up to 4? Uh, is it, you know, what does, it, how does it change? So that's what we're looking to find, that relationship between the previous case head loss and the new case head loss, where the only thing you did didn't change the diameter, didn't change the velocity. Not, you changed the velocity, but not the viscosity or the density of the fluid, right? And you didn't change the flow regime. It stays laminar. Okay, well, how do you work through that problem? Well, you recall that the friction factor is equal to 64 over the Reynolds number, and that the friction factor is some head loss, d over L, divided by v squared over 2g, 64 Reynolds number, rho v d over mu. Is this v right here? the same as this V right here. Are they the same Vs? Yeah, and those Vs are the average velocity, average velocity. Okay, so what, do, what, what you can do is you can rearrange this and you can get that the head loss is equal to 32 times the viscosity times the velocity times the length of the pipe divided by rho d squared g. Does that equation look okay? Can you see you're just doing the algebraic manipulation? Okay, so at this point you just say, okay, if I come in uh, and I write the equation t t twice, what, what, what do I find 
for the relationship between the head loss for the second case, it, it's going to be 32 mu. The velocity for the second case, length hasn't changed, density, diameter, g. This is equal to uh, 32 mu 2 times the initial case velocity divided by L or times L rho d squared g. So that's equal to 2 times the head loss for the first case. So I doubled it. So remains unchanged, increases by 50%. Which one is it? C or D? C. Very good. Increases by 100%. Right. It doubles. Right. Very good. Now we do the turbulent flow. It's order, disorderly, uh, there's rapid fluctuations, there's swirling, and it's mixing, a lot of mixing. So you have a turbulent velocity profile that's very much plug-shaped, flat. It still has no slip boundary conditions, but the gradient's severe at the boundary, and it's flat in the, in the center, in the core. Well, this has been studied a lot because it's very practical. It goes all the way back to, you know, 1900s, early 1900s, uh, 1939. Colebrook put out an equation for the friction factor, but it's an implicit equation, meaning what you're looking for, typically, the friction factors on both sides of the equation. But it, it curve fit the data for turbulent flow when the Reynolds number greater than 2300. What did they have right here? Well, epsilon is a surface roughness. The surface roughness, and D is a diameter. So it's like rough here, and how large are the, the, uh, the, the surface roughness in some sort of length scale compared to the diameter of the pipe? So very smooth, smooth pipes, that goes to zero. Okay. Where do you get smooth? A lot of PVC is very smooth. Copper drawn, copper tubing is smooth. There's a lot of smooth pipe out there. Uh, where do you get really rough pipe? Concrete, uh, cast iron that's been in service or other, where it's not drawn in the manufacturing process. Well, Holland in uh, 1983, uh, published a different equation, but it's explicit. And so this one doesn't have maybe the, you know, whenever you do something first, it helps and people remember it for a long time. Um, but this is a great equation. It also has the Reynolds number, just like the Colebrook equation has a Reynolds number, and the relative roughness in there. But you can then solve for it. I want to spend some time on the Moody diagram. I th did I share with you before that I've done this, and I may not do it this semester, but I'll leave a big sheet of paper and I'll just have the question, redraw from memory the Moody diagram with as much detail as possible. It's a really good exercise, you know, blank sheet of paper, recall. So what's on the x-axis? Reynolds number. Is it defined correctly as you see it? What's the lowest Reynolds number on this plot? For this plot, what's the lowest Reynolds number? Right here is what value? Thousand. Right here, what is that value? Is it zero? It's 500, right? So it's a log scale, and you would go, okay, that's 900, 800, 700, 600, 500. That's how you did it, right? You have to have good eyes to read it, but. And so right here is what? This was 1,000. This is. 10,000, this is 100,000, this is a million, 10 million, 100 million. So what do they call this, a decade or an order of magnitude? Yeah, an order of magnitude. A decade is just 10. So two decades is 20, three decades, 30. 
But here you got one order of magnitude, two, three, four. That's a large range of Reynolds number from very low flow, low, you know, Reynolds number to very high Reynolds number. We also know that around 2000 or a little above 2000, somewhere in this vicinity, is a critical Reynolds number for flow in a pipe, isn't it? And so we would expect that up in this region you'd make a transition from laminar flow to turbulent flow. Let's take a look at the y-axis. What is on the y-axis? Friction factor. Uh, they didn't define it on the y-axis. I don't know why they tucked it down here. So it says the friction factor is 2, let's say F is equal to 2D, D stands for diameter, delta P divided by rho V squared L. Do you agree? Is that our friction factor? Uh, it's yeah, it's pipe flow. And you can use it for non-circular, you know, duct flow or elliptical flow, but you use the hydraulic diameter and you'll come in close, okay? Close enough for fluids. Yes, you can use it for other, the closer you're to circular, you're better. All right? Okay. But do you like this friction factor? He's, he's tucked the definition of the y-axis right there. Do you agree? Uh, a lot of Moody diagrams, if you really look at it, the y-axis, a lot of times, the Reynolds number is really easy. Oh, yeah, rho V D over mu. No problem. Everybody gets that. But the friction factor is a little more challenging. And so a lot of times I would put that one half, you know, down there, one half rho V squared. That's the what pressure? One half rho V squared. Velocity pressure. The, the, the pressure loss, and then you have diameter over length, D over L. Let's kind of group this and that one. It, it's a good friction factor. He's okay. This one's good. Let's take a look. Uh, what's a, a value of 0.1? Here's a value of 0.01, right? That's a factor of a 10. Isn't that a order of magnitude? So uh, what's, what is this zero down here? No, it, it continues to drop. What scale is the y-axis? A linear scale or a log scale? It's plotted log, just like on the x-axis. Both x and y-axis are log scale, so it's a log-log plot. Moody diagrams are log-log plots. If you want to capture a lot of data, put it on a log-log plot. Now, in this laminar region, the friction factor is a straight line on the Moody diagram. Do you see that? And they even give you the equation. Laminar flow, 64 over Reynolds number. That constant, 64 over Reynolds number. So how did they get it to be a straight line on a log-log plot? Well, that's if you plotted y is equal to constant over x, if you put that on a log-log plot, it's a straight line. It's a straight line with negative one slope because, there you go, the offsets is log of constant. All right, what's out in here? This is now all your turbulent region, and you have one set of curve that goes down the bottommost curve. It's for smooth pipe. The other curves that peel off at different Reynolds number, they come more distinct, are for uh, pipes that have different roughness. And they measure it by the relative roughness, epsilon over D. And so this curve right here is relative roughness of 0.05. This curve right here has a relative roughness of 0.01. So sometimes they'll put the number not out here like it's a separate axis. They'll put it right on the on the line so it's not as confusing in the plot. So they'll put uh, 0.001 right here saying this whole line has a relative roughness of 0.001. What was epsilon? 
in the definition of relative roughness? It's the roughness of the material. You can measure it in millimeters, centimeters, whatever you want to measure it in. I've seen it in feet. It just makes it a very small number. And uh, concrete, drawn tubing, plexiglass, glass, plastic. These are very small relative roughnesses. And then some of the larger ones would be older material, old water mains, uh, sewer lines that are old. Those would have larger relative roughness due to junk in there. <clears throat> so that's for a smooth pipe down in here. And now, what do they have here is a dashed line. See the dashed line? What's to the right of that dashed line? What's characteristic? Why did they separate from the left of the dashed line? What? Yeah, these lines of relative roughness are flat over here. That's what it is. So that line of 0.01 is pretty flat. The line of 0.05, relative roughness is very flat. Okay, so out in that region, if let's say I'm at uh, this, uh, let me get rid of some of these color schemes in here. Let's say I'm at uh, a, a Reynolds number of 10 to the 6th, and I'm at a relative roughness of 0.01. Can you see how you would get the friction factor? Come up, then read across, and it's just a little bit below 0.04. That's the friction factor. Let's say I said I still have the same relative roughness, but my Reynolds number is 10 to the 7. Did the friction factor change? That's right. So out in this region, it's Reynolds number independent. Sometimes they'll have a, a name for that region. They'll call this region the fully turbulent region. They'll call it the complete turbulent region. Whatever name they have for it, it just is Reynolds number independent. So the friction factor is, in general, a function of the Reynolds number and the relative roughness out in the turbulent region. And if it's fully turbulent, it's just a function of the relative roughness. That's all. Does that make sense? But in this region to the left, in here, uh, all the way down to the smooth curve, it's truly a function of both Reynolds number and relative roughness. So all in here, you have to know the rel both the Reynolds number and the relative roughness. Okay. Now, um, sometimes um, you can uh, get some very simple approximations to correlations. Okay. Uh, one simple approximation is to say all I care about is um, smooth pipe, smooth pipe, that's very common to have smooth pipe, flow in smooth pipe, and also in a modest range of Reynolds number, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, somewhere in there. And so somebody will come in and they'll say, I want a simple a correlation, and I want it to fit that experimental data based, you know, plotted in the Moody diagram. Um, so um, instead of getting a correlation like this, which is implicit in F, the Colebrook equation done in 1939. This tries to get the friction factor as a function of the relative roughness right here and the Reynolds number right here. To see that? And it's implicit. It, the friction factor is on both sides of the equation. Or the Holland equation done in 1983, the friction factor is only on the left-hand side and it's a function of the relative roughness and the Reynolds number. Some people will even want a simple correlation for a smooth flow. And we can do that, and it's a good little exercise to do that. What you would do is you would pick off a couple values. Let's say you want to pick off you want to pick off one that's easy to read, but I've already picked off something. 6 times 10 to the 4 right there intersects about 0.02. 
And I went up one decade, and I just said, oh, 6 times 10 to the 5. 6 times 10 to the 5 right here. And that looks like it picks off around 6 times 10 to the 5, 6 times 10 to the 6, and you pick off values of the friction factor. Okay? Those two values of the friction factor, you put a line like this, a straight line, a straight line on a log-log plot, just like up here, it was uh, the Reynolds number to the negative 1. That slope then is negative 1. Here it's not as steep. Maybe it'll be a uh, constant Reynolds number to the negative 1 fifth. So the friction factor approximated in that range would be something like that, which if you go ahead and work through the math, uh, different people have different correlations, but that constant you can find maybe 0 0.1716 Reynolds number to the negative 0.2 or negative one-fifth. Other people have fit straight lines more in this region in here. And you'll get another one known as the Blasius. It's like a friction factor of a constant of about 0 0.303 Reynolds number to the negative 0.25. It's a little steeper slope right here in the blue region. It's, it's steeper. It's not as steep as the negative 1, but it's steeper than the negative 0.2. Those are often useful, very useful, because you have a lot of conditions where it's flow and a smooth pipe. Let's take a look out here. So I went and found some discussion of uh, the Darcy friction factor is that they're going to talk about the Colebrook equation and then they're going to talk about the Holland equation, the swami Jayan equation, somebody else's solution, somebody else's equation, somebody else's equation, the Blasius correlation, which I just showed you, that's a simple correlation. So even though you have uh, the Moody diagram, a lot of people have put in correlations or approximations. Let's back up here. Here was the Colebrook equation, true? And then come down, Holland equation, then somebody else. And you'll find different textbooks will report some of these equations, but I've not found one that reports them all. Yes, sir? Yeah. Uh, and I'll show you one that has the least that I know of. But you'll want to look at some of them are only good, like the two I just kind of showed you to begin with are only good in the um, smooth Reynolds number, you know, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 range. Okay. Uh, the Colebrook was trying to fit over the whole uh, range of Reynolds number and relative roughness. And the Holland is all that whole turbulent region. But they wouldn't be used in the laminar region, would they? Here's some other ones. Some other ones, you can see how complicated they get. Another solution, the Blasius. Here's that one I showed, negative 0.25, negative a quarter, 0 0.079. Did I write down 0 0.079? I think I had a different number, 0.3. Oh, you know what? He, if you multiply that by 4, 4 times 8, about 32, that's around the right number. Okay. Um, come on down. There's a lot of approximations, and they even show you the year, and they put a little table together. If you want to look for some of these correlations, try to code them up, you can. One thing to point out um, is we use the, that 64 over Reynolds number for laminar flow. That's that Darcy friction factor. Some people have a different friction factor. Let me see. Let me jump over to the Fanning friction factor site. This is a different definition of F. So it's the shear stress divided by the 1 half rho V squared, the dynamic pressure. And that's related to the, the Darcy by being uh, four times smaller. So the friction factor, this friction factor, the fanning friction factor, is one-fourth of the Darcy friction factor. I hate to confuse you, but there's two friction factors out there. 
Um, one is typically for external flow. One is for internal flow, but you can take the external flow and use it in pipe flow. So you just have to be cautious. It reflects how a lot of things were done in the development. You know, this guy wrote a paper, he put out this equation. Somebody else wrote a paper, he put out this equation. Here's one that I think is uh, very good. The other article didn't have it. Churchill. Okay, Churchill. He uh, published it in 1977. Here's the formula. There's a friction factor. It's functional Reynolds number and this constant A and B. So get the constant A, Reynolds number, relative roughness. I know the power is 16 and power of 0.9. And then B is 1 over the Reynolds number to the power of 16. But I've used this and I've seen other people code it up, the Churchill equation. And it works for both the laminar region as well as the turbulent region. It actually will transition through that transition region. It doesn't look like it would work in it, but it does cover both laminar and turbulent flow regions, and it covers it very well. So if you had to code up one equation, I'd point you to the Churchill equation.